Okay. That's you got it. Awesome. All right. Question one, um, program address. 909 Southwest Willow Road. What number? 909. 909 Southwest Willow Road. Okay. And I'm going to share my screen with you. If, the, if this yep. is a problem, just let me know. No problem. Okay. Okay, first apprenticeship approach. I'm going for competency based. That's my recommendation. Your options are time based, competency, or hybrid. Competency. Got it. Yeah. Um, how many total instructors do you have? I have myself. I've got Katarina, who, I mean, she's uh, she's kind of piping in whenever she she can and. As far as instructor for workshop stuff, there's Jeff Higdon, who's our facility manager. He can teach things like welding and, and shop. Yep. Okay. Um, what this means is that the max number you can bring on at any given time is has to be equal to the number of journey workers that you have. So, so Missouri wants the starting ratio to be one to one. Oh, is that so? Okay. Yeah. Now there may be a way around this because you're teaching such diverse skill sets that maybe we can count guest instructors or something like that. Um, but I think th this is just a starting point and it's a living document. And if you get a big influx of applicants, we can go back to the Department of Labor and see what they think. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. 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 <clears throat> so I'm going to skip over a wage schedule for now because we're, I think we'll save that for the, for later. Um, yep. the probationary period. So, so typical apprenticeships include some probationary period of employment, um, which gives you the, the flexibility to end the apprenticeship agreement. Um, I don't know if it's mandatory. It, does that appeal to you at all? Is that important? A probationary period, like once they're hired or once started, once just in an internship? Well, probationary period is like, congrats, you're an apprentice. They show up and start working. They turn out to be a dirtbag. Yeah. Okay, that's a, that's a good thing. It's that or like they got to visit or interview on site because I, I really want to see the people before they come because mm -hmm. there's a bunch of people that look really good on paper and even in conversation. But what really matters is the first day they start working. Like, do they, man, uh, we had some people who, who on paper look like really good and actually they were actual doing physical work mm -hmm. before. But when they came in, they were like so clue, clueless that it was really hard to work with them and motiv motivate them. It's, I want to see how a person works. So yeah. either like the, this probationary period or a requirement of for the application, you spend a day working with us, something like that. I'm going to leave it at 30 days just because um, it gives you more flexibility. Um, yeah. Okay. And there were, it, you know, that's not going to deter anybody from applying. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. <clears throat> so now you're going to see um, the current work process, which is what the Department of Labor calls our curriculum. Um, I can, I'll send this document to you so you can like see how I did this. But in essence, everything that's in red is from the existing production technologist apprenticeship. And I just sort of, pulled out the pieces and put them into what you're already doing, if that makes sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and all of the things that I could find hyperlinks to on the wiki as existing topics, um, I linked them directly so that the Department of Labor, if they need to know precisely what you're doing, they can see that. And so mm -hmm. far, they're happy with that. Okay. So um, I think the key, the key is uh, the way I broke it down is first broad topic leadership and management. Uh, second is collaborative. Mm -hmm. Third is knowledge foundation. Fourth is trade skills. And fifth is design. And then sixth is production. 
Now we can reorganize however you want, but this this is essentially me taking what um, yeah. uh, we talked about with um, previous curriculum development conversations and turned it in and just sort mm -hmm. of built, cat built categories for the part of labor. This isn't chronological. Mm -hmm. It's it's mix and match as you, as, as you see it. Mm -hmm. And be and keep in mind because it's a competency based program, I I'm going to remove all of these columns for hours, trainer certification, and employees initials. Like like essentially, I'm going to remove all of these columns because they're irrelevant. They are irrelevant because what? They they don't need them. Yeah, because you're a competency based program. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so here's the meat and potatoes. Related technical instruction. So th this is, you know, forget OSC for a second. If you're yep. an electrician, what this means is you've got your nine to five on the job learning that you have. Related training instruction is work outside of your on the job. So you're not getting paid for this, but it's supporting your skill and knowledge base. Um, it can be online training. It could be a class at a college. It could be extra instruction that you provide. So I understand that's kind of open-ended, but at the end of the day, what we need to do is come up with at least 144 hours worth of mm -hmm. um, some curriculum additionally to support everything we just went through in the work process. Um, so it's different. So in with the work process, meaning the nine to five, the, the actual doing? <clears throat> yeah, from the Department of Labor's eyes, the curriculum we've already developed is the on-the-job training. That is what they're doing from when the day starts until the, the work day ends, that's what they're getting paid for. The five things you meant, like collaborative techniques, knowledge foundation, yeah, yeah, all exactly. those trade skills. <laughs> uh-huh. Related training In addition, Okay. Yeah. Okay, so let me get this. So, so related, uh, do you have this document that you can share or that's not online yet? Uh, yeah, I can share it. I'm keeping it in Word though. So um, yeah. because of the yeah. formatting. So um, yeah. I can send this to you after this. I can send it to you now okay. if you want. We're just going to be working on different versions. Okay. So so you've got this on-the-job training, which which is like all over the place, right? We got at all mm -hmm. these things. So what, what do we pump into this RTI? Um, like just come up with more other topics that are primarily what like book or like is that class or yeah so so study or I, it could it? be it could be all of the above i would i would probably bias it towards knowledge foundation and i would do mm -hmm. um because it the topics can be the same the difference is mm -hmm. that instead of you teaching hydraulics and pneumatics off of the actual machine that you built in the shop and playing around with it, like hands-on in a, in a process they're, they're actually getting like paid as part of the apprenticeship to do. What you're saying is, all right, now go watch this YouTube video or like you Demi or whatever open source, mm -hmm. you know, MIT, mm -hmm. MIT open okay. courseware, right? Like go, go okay. watch this class and I want you to come back tomorrow after watching it, having, you know, draw a schematic for this or that, or like be prepared to talk about, you know, um, some, you know, fluid, fluid mechanics topic, right? So this is, is this require, like, what's the requirements there? Like, is it independent study or this is discussion time? It's everything? It could be anything that's structured as go do this, go like, here's what we're learning about. That isn't a part of the, the, work out so go do learn this and then we meet about it and then like how much time on my side so say we do the 30 hours for apprenticeship time that's paid would this yep. be the remaining 104 like 144 hours per, per year. year 144 hours so that's like a couple of hours it's 50 weeks like two a couple hours per week two or three hours per week so we're spending are we adding this? So if it's 30, um, are you making an assumption that the, the paid time is 30 as well? 
<clears throat> yeah, I, I would. I, I think that's a safe bet because that's the minimum. So that's the minimum thirty, and then, but this doesn't go to like your forty full. So can it be like thirty, thirty-two, or thirty-five? Yeah, it could be I'm as sure, much. I'm as sure they're. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's flexible. It's kind of kind of flexible, but it has to add up to 144 hours, which you quantify how much. So you say, how do you quantify this? How do you put it on um, paper? Just in the same way that you would if this was a college course, where you say like you're gonna have three classes okay. a week, each are an hour long, and this is what they were gonna talk talk about. Okay, or it could be like a class uh, assignment. They do an assignment. We discuss the assignment like three three hours right. a week. Yeah, exactly. That'll be cool. Yep. Okay. Got it. I mean, I, I could literally take, and, and let me know what you think, but I could literally take everything in knowledge foundation, just the, the topics, put them down as RTI, make you like open source ecology, the sponsor for that. Because like most employers will send their, their apprentices out to like a trade school to take a class. So that's how it's usually structured. So instead of doing that, you're, keep, you're keeping them in house and you're saying like some of this you're gonna learn in on the job and some of it you're gonna have to study on your own. So I can mm -hmm. keep the topics the same. Um, and it's kind of up to you on what is covered in each topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I would, uh, from the purposes of a two-year apprenticeship, uh, Let's see, do you, in the knowledge base, do you have anything regarding collaboration or maybe, maybe not? Maybe that's something that comes out through culture. It's not a thing explicitly taught, but it's like how we behave. And then maybe we focus on the hardcore, like numeracy. Here's, um, I don't know, enterprise training or just technical skills, math, physics, this right. just foundational knowledge, which I think would be important because like I'm finding out people can't count or, or like, Right. Yeah, because people don't can't count. <laughs> it's one yeah. like, big discovery for the apprenticeship here. Yeah, so so collaborative <laughs> techniques is a major part section of the work process. So that's collaborative literacy, right. open source software, documentation, business models. Yeah. Oh yeah, beautiful. Um, sure. And and the, again, this is tied directly to your wiki. So you've already done the work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then something like you know, knowledge foundation, <clears throat> this yeah. is, yeah. these are the categories I, I built roughly from all of the brainstorming that you did on a call a while ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's what's there is broad. Like for example, if you want to focus on aquaponic greenhouse, well, there's food, food and what do you got there? Food and food and agriculture. Yep, Yeah. that's that's aquaponics. I can come up with that. We're doing that right now. And it's kind of cool because we're re re reiterating the productivity. And the, yeah. once again, like I remind myself, of the productivity of such a greenhouse is so intense that it does lend itself to a business model. And yeah, anyway, that's sure. uh, exciting, exciting. Okay, perfect. So so I'll I, I'll do that. I'll, I'll just take what I think is in your head and I'll put it on paper. And then if there's any issues, I just want to advance this. I just want to get in their inbox. No, this is beautiful. I, it's good. It's You got the right categories, yep. Okay, cool. This is good. Um, all right, so before we go into wages, uh, I'm just going to cover one more thing, which is, okay, mm -hmm. term of the apprenticeship, okay. The minimum term is 2,000 hours, which equals one year. That's that's the minimum requirement to be a registered apprenticeship. From day 2, one. 2,000 hours. Correct. OK, 300 times 8, uh, or even 7, is 2,000 hours. No problem. Where are you getting yep. the 300? Less than 365. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, so, um, so, so that's the minimum. We have been talking about this as a two-year program. Two-year uh, program, you better believe it. Because okay. six months or one year is not enough. So, so here's the thing: Do you want to leave it at the application at two thousand, or do you want to bump it up to four thousand to make it two years? Um. Uh, tell me the advantages or disadvantages of both. If you do, if your minimum is 2000 and you get somebody who is ready to go and they want to start their business and, and they're capable, they're mini you, they don't have to stick around for an extra year to get the check for the apprenticeship. Yeah. 
you think that's actually going to attract uh, more qualified candidates? I don't think it's going to have any impact on, on the candidates you get. Because in the, in the hiring process, you're going to explain to them, this on paper is a one or two year program. Here's what we, here are the competencies you need to meet. The earliest you can disenroll with the credential is whatever the minimum is that I put on paper. So if you select this as a 2000 hour uh, program that, and they are competent in your eyes after 2000 hours, then congrats, you're a registered apprentice or like you have this credential. If they're con if you put down 4,000 hours and you think they're competent before then, they can't just get the credential just because you say you're competent because they haven't completed what you said requires competence. Uh, sorry, you said that that's, that could apply to 2,000 or 4,000 only? Well, it, if it's 2,000, then you have more flexibility to rate competence and get people out of there early. If you say 4,000, mm -hmm. they, they could achieve, in theory, competence before that 4,000 hour mark. And they could still leave. They just won't have the stamp, that, that certificate that says they completed an apprenticeship. So you're saying that basically we're making it easier for somebody to complete it with this? Right. We're making it easier for somebody to get the apprenticeship if the, the certificate that they completed the apprenticeship, if they're able to complete it in one year. Uh, tell me more about, so you don't think that's gonna affect the kind of candidate that we're gonna get? Well, Ima like imagine, I've never heard of OSE. I just think it's a really cool mm -hmm. opportunity. And I'm, let's say I'm average competence. I'm not a genius, mm -hmm. but, but I'm super, definitely capable of completing the program. When I go through this application process, I'm gonna wanna know how long you expect me to be there. And mm -hmm. so, so mm -hmm. I think you as the employer just need to have a crystal clear understanding of I think this is going to, like, I expect you to be here for two years. However, if you're competent before the two-year mark, you can still complete this based on your competency and get the stamp of, I completed a registered apprenticeship. Or okay. you can say, um, this is a really ambitious program. It is for sure going to be two years long. And... If you leave beforehand, then you give up the certificate of having completed an apprentice. Mm. Wow, there's advantages and disadvantages to both. Like, I definitely believe. Like, so, so the this this apprenticeship kind of kind of uh, tempered my ambition for how quickly I believe people can learn. Yeah. So unless we get near genius candidates, it's not going to be one year it's going to yeah. be like two years. Cause I mean, the breadth of what we teach and the kind of skill set that I would like, and I would like to pay for it's more than one year. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm leaning towards the, the 4,000, but we can still achieve that if our competency is defined to meet that 4,000, what we think is that 4,000 goal, right? Yeah. My recommendation is, is, but let me just give you the options. If you leave it at 2000, then you can still enter in an apprenticeship agreement with somebody to say, this is really a two-year program. You're going to be here for two years and I'm committed to paying you for two years provided you meet our internal standards. And that's our deal, right? And then if you think that they're competent before that two-year mark, you always leave the door open to graduate them early. So maximum flexibility occurs when you advertise this as, uh, or excuse me, maximum flexibility for you occurs when you apply under the bare minimum. Yeah, well, you're right, you're right, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, okay, and, and the reason I think that's important is because one, like my recommendation to you is going to be uh, whatever we set the wage schedule at, you want to predict as though it's going to apply to somewhere slightly above the lowest common denominator. So the, the bare minimum competency of an apprentice that you would be willing to bring on 
that should set that should in your eyes be the benchmark for the wages because you can always go above that but you can't go below and i think financially it makes more sense for you to say okay this is really a two year program for most people so i'm going to we're going to do our our, our revenue calculations based on having to pay an apprentice a two year wage schedule the two-year schedule that ends at a minimum of 85% at the 24-month mark. Right. So we can say that on, on paper, but we have the option, like if that happens before that, we can accelerate it. Yes. Uh, that, sound, that, sounds, that sounds good. That sounds like flexible. Because if we put 4,000, then if a person, what, what would be the ramifications of 4,000? If a person actually gets the competency after one year, then what? If, if they're if they're that competent and they want to go off on their own, take what they've learned and go start their own business, nothing's preventing them from doing that. They're just not going, the Department of Labor is just not going to sign off on their apprenticeship as having been completed. Okay. Okay. So in practice, it's um, like in practice, we say to the candidate, this is a, it's a two-year program, right. but um the only case where the 2000 would apply, like if we put, well, the only case the 4000 would be advantage, advantageous, advantageous is where somebody wants to leave and we want to keep them around because of the incentive that they won't get the certificate. Is that kind of the logic or? I mean, the, the, the 4,000 is more advantageous because, <clears throat> well, actually, now that I'm thinking about this, the wage schedule kind of complicates things. So you can't have a 2,000 hour apprenticeship and have a wage schedule for 4,000 hours. So now that I think about it, it may make more sense to just blanket, this is a two-year program because the possibility of something, somebody being competent enough after one year sounds super low and yeah. you're you have to do a two-year financial projection for each apprentice in order i to agree i work. agree yeah okay. that feels better we need to plan on a two-year schedule right uh with the assumption that we're not going to assume genius or or exception super exceptional performance we want to work with a lot of people we just know that it's going to take some more time and we're right. willing to do that because we want to change the world and that means we need to involve more people and most people are going to take longer yeah, and you, you want apprentices showing up expecting a two-year program. That's actually better. So we, we get rid of any notion of somebody, oh, I can get in. Because I feel like right now, some people in an apprenticeship are like, oh, yeah, this is an exciting thing, but I'm not really committing to the results that come out of it. They're just going back to their own lives. So that would minimize that kind of a dynamic too, right? Right, right. Okay, let's do the 4,000. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm in. Now, with, with that decided, the big question, remaining question we have to answer before we submit is wage schedule. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So let me break down my thoughts on this. Mm -hmm. um, set the I would set the wage schedule at what you think is fair, without considering your financial current financial limitations. And the reason I would do that is because. What we need is this to be a legit program to be able to raise money to, to, to finance the first class because you don't have a revenue stream to support this yet. And once we, can, once we raise money, we say we have, we've got qualified candidates or applicants that we want to work with. We have a registered apprenticeship program and we have the GI Bill in play. Now, who wants to sponsor a scholarship to fund the payroll for these guys, you know, uh, apprentices going through. That to me is a different argument than we're going to pay them what we can afford today. And um, because that, mm -hmm. that right off the bat is going to limit, you know, the applicant pool. If you're constraining yourself mm -hmm. by current financial cash flow. Right. Yeah. Okay. Who, who would we go for the, the sponsorships? What, what so, are your thoughts on that? I, I, would, I would probably take at least two routes. The first is kiva.org. So they, it's just a uh, platform. It's like GoFundMe 
but instead of yeah. you know donate money, it's a zero interest loan that if you don't pay back, you know, there's no fine, you know, there's no legal repercussion. And it's like it's designed for moonshot ideas or getting people like you and me the money that they need to fund crazy, you know, slow but huge impact, slow growth, but huge impact ventures. Um, What's the typical payback schedule for a Kiva loan if it's repaid? I don't know yet. So are we assuming that that's an option that we just don't repay, we default? I, I wouldn't assume that because like built into your assumption here is that you can sell these eco homes as you build them. Yes, and yes. we better, yeah. Yeah. So, so there, there is some. Uh, I think there's mm. some financial analysis that needs to take place in which you say, mm -hmm. how many apprentices can we afford at what wages? Given we're going to sell a CD eco home for, you know, it's a, just a multivariable linear equation that we we have to work out somehow. But then, how many can we afford? Yeah, but that number is one, two, or three right now, though. So, I mean, I think. I don't know, but that, that question keeps coming back up then because with three people, we can make all the projections on on that. But I would hope that, I mean, for, for the value of the apprenticeship, like three is, I don't know, I, I would want more because like in terms of my time allocation, like I'm, the impact that we're having in terms of how many people we teach, that would limit how many houses we can build. Because the idea was if we have a 12, 12 person team, we can literally knock out a house in one week. And that's like super exciting. Like with 12 people, it's, there's enough synergy that man, it's just the experience is different. Like right now we're fluctuating between like six, 12 and 18 people. And you can see like when, when all with all hands on deck, like with six people, it's like you start to slow down with 12 people. Like you can't, you can't not, not, not because uh, you're forced to, but just because the synergy, it's actually, there's a special effect that happens. Uh, yeah. So ideally that would be the case, but. Um, so, so now just, a, the, just, just the clarify, development velocity. Just, just to clarify, it, all of the instruction is happening literally from you and two other people. Yes. What about the people who are enrolled in the program now? Are any of them gonna stick around and we can, I mean, we can, hell yeah. I mean, we can, we, I think we can actually, I mean, there's one guy who's doing a 3d printing who's, who's getting into instructor level quality. So, um, there's, we can definitely get more people. Um, but the idea, the, the thing is, it's like, it's the thing we're str struggling is the skill set. Like nobody, like for me and Katarina, how we design and build and have that accountability for materials and workflows and all that and the integration of design to, to engineering, to build, to workflow. It's like nobody in the world does it. Yeah. It's like, it's crazy. I can't believe nobody is doing this. Right. So we can get people like the, the power instructors. That's like me and Katarina, you can say, um, we can definitely get a bunch, like, you know, get your average instructor to teach this topic. Yeah, we can expand that. We, I guess the immediate option is, okay, so we enroll some other people who, I mean, would they have to be on site or? Um, I, that to me is kind of fuzzy. Like my instinct here is, is, is figure out a way to get 12 people that you, would be willing to serve as instructors. It could, it, they don't have to be permanent. It could be, they could come in and teach a class on 3D printing and then leave or whatever the case is over that two year period. But if what you're saying is that like, to me, the constraint is you need, you need a class of 12 apprentices. If you have a 12 class of 12 apprentices, you can really get this thing off the ground. Like, like it's right. Right. And so, so you're going to design, you're going to design the program around a first class of 12 people. You're going to select yep. based on that need and you'll figure mm -hmm. out how to get 12 instructors to satisfy the department of labor requirement for a one-to-one -one ratio. Like to me, that's a problem for later. Um, okay. And Let's, not, yeah. on, okay. not only that, but okay. you can, that's a conversation. If you have a relationship with the department of labor person who's handling application, that's a conversation with them where you can just be like, look, 
like we don't have 12 permanent full-time faculty, but over the course of two years, we're going to have at least 12 people come in and teach specialized skills that fill out the work process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is that something, are you still in communication with Deborah and, and the people there? Like, can you have yeah. another conversation or should I be talking to them more? Um, no, no, no. I mean, I think it'd be great if you hopped on a call with us, but um, they're not going to be as flexible timing wise. Um, and yes, I still have communicate. Like they're waiting on us to pull this out and send it. Okay. Well, don't you see what you find out the next time you talk to them? Cause yeah, my schedule is just totally jammed. Yeah. So yeah, let's find out more. Okay. But that's good. Yeah. With 12. Yeah, man, that, that's I, I'm shooting for, I want to get 12. Got it. That's okay. what Jesus said. Right. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, all right. So, uh, oh, going wow. on. Yeah. Oh, so, so going going on to the wage schedule. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. So the okay. way the way I think about this is like, you know, if you start at I don't know ten or sorry, let's, let's start at fifteen, end at thirty an hour, right? You can't afford that right now. That's fine. But. Um, that, like let's start at 15 end at 30 play around with raises let's say every six months or something like that uh to get from 15 to 30 and then figure out over the two-year lifespan what how much money do you need in the bank to fund that right okay and then okay. multiply multiply that by 12 and that's that's your that's your ask when you go either to kiva or to donors just get it on paper so that this thing can get approved and then make the argument of okay like, i need yeah because all that stuff it's like if, if business collapses or it expands that's either a no-brainer or we say we can't do it and then we we go from there right yeah what do, what do you mean by that sorry oh i mean that well we said we're gonna do 15 well at that point we have the program on paper but when it comes down to negotiating the class and we find that oh we can't pay them we can't we can't go forward with enrollment that's all exactly Right, exactly. So it's, it's a self-solving question, yeah. Right, but you know, through through that wage schedule, you're you're essentially answering like the two biggest problems that are going to prevent people from committing. How long am I going to be there? What and like what what am I going to be doing? And how much am I going to get paid? And fifteen to thirty is more than competitive, considering the veteran side is going to get jabbed on top of that, and um, there's a high probability, in my opinion, that you're actually going to be able to raise money for this once it has stamps of credibility from the VA and DOL. Okay. And you think the number one, so number one place is Kiva, or that's just a multiple prong approach? I mean, I think it's multiple prong. Um, and I think that, you know, you're already a nonprofit. So at some point mm -hmm. you had to get donors, like, this may be a problem for somebody who has experience fundraising, but like to me, the 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 value proposition for donors is pretty freaking clear, like much clearer. Well, just for clarity, we never went to donors. We basically people just dropped money on our lap, or we never did it. Okay, so so that may be. I mean, if that if that's a source of um, if that gives you pause or hesitation, like I don't know that that changes the application. Like the steps that we're taking now, but it is a problem that needs to be solved. Right. Like it, it's more a question: Are you comfortable with the strategy of having external people fund this first class? Yeah, okay. of course. Yeah. We can. No, oh yeah, actually. Oh no, no. Well, I do it very. So I I don't go like mass campaign, right. mass campaign to do this or that. I have conversations. That's all here and there. Yeah. But in fact, just. One guy just just to I, now that I remind myself. One guy said, "Oh yeah, I'm, I'm looking, considering seriously funding two apprentices next year." So yeah, stuff like that will happen. Yeah, sure. Yes. So <clears throat> this is not my wheelhouse, but you know, you can do Kickstarter, you can do Kiva, you can do a lot of other things. Like the 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 work that has to be done between certified application and cash in the bank is a lot of marketing essentially it's like sh telling the story of what this program is and what we what the ask is um in a way that's going to potentially reach the people who could make a difference financially mm -hmm. 
because like I think I think part of that story has to be how does this become financially self-sustaining? And the answer is pretty clear. We build a house every week. We're like over a period of two years, we're going to build X houses and sell them for however many thousands of dollars each. That's where it has to be. There's no 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 substitute for uh, efficiency. Just being good at what we do. Yep. Yeah. Um. So if that's the case, then. I can, I can come up with a wage schedule for you using that calculator. You know, we know the starting point, we know the ending point and get the first draft over to the Department of Labor. And then they're gonna have a bunch of comments and stuff that they are gonna send back. And we, at least we start that process. And then if we have changes between now and then we can always adjust. Mm -hmm. And yeah, look at those numbers. and. What do you think is the difference between saying starting with because the only other option is 15 and 30 sounds sounds good no no problem uh, what's the difference between that and minimum wage which is like say 1030 like are we going to actually get less less candidate interest i mean naturally so right uh, yeah really? absolutely I, I think you're going to get less candidate interest um, mm -hmm. i think that mm -hmm. um, in addition to the fact that the starting wage has to be at least 50% of what they end at. My, uh, in all uh, honesty, the, the goal for that two years, and I don't think two years may be enough, but after two years, I want it to, to be uh, at 50, but I actually don't think it, that two years may be enough for 50. But if you say 30, yeah, uh, I think that that should be not a problem. Uh, it's it's really like the the outstanding candidate who also becomes a manager like but management I mean that's that's another two year program or you know business school, but a manager would be much more valuable than thirty dollars an hour. Oh oh totally but but keep in mind you can always exceed that. Mm -hmm. So like <clears throat> we're operating yeah. on the assumption yeah we're operating on the assumption that we have to do the bare minimum to get this thing off the ground and okay. prove the concept yeah you can always exceed it and. After your first class signs on, you may have six months yeah. down the road, your second class starts and have this cascading thing where you, now you're producing revenue and, you know, it, mm -hmm. it's, it becomes self-sustaining. Um, yeah. So, so that's, that's, that's my recommendation. I think, you know, funding is going to be a huge issue, but in terms of the amount of work that has to go into coming up with that plan, but this is the, like, right here is the keystone, like the... This is this is where it all starts. Is like you planting a flag on the ground and saying like, "This is who we are. This is what we're going to do. Who's with us?" Right. If the program wants to focus on the construction, the building part, uh, and we emphasize the the construction as opposed to the other aspects, because you got five different areas, is there any stipulation that says we we got to do all five and or emphasize one versus the other? Like, are we? how much flexibility do we have for how much we allocate to each of the five areas? Oh, it's completely up to you. It's completely up to you. So the, the five areas are based on the brainstorm of everything that you guys have already talked about and covered as, as like the attendees of the existing apprenticeship, right? That was that, that big mapping exercise. Mm -hmm. You, and all of the details of the curriculum are tied back to the wiki. So you can say that, you know, open so source software isn't nearly as important to me as carpentry, plumbing, and electrical work, but it doesn't matter yeah. because there's no hour allocation to them. So you can say my apprentices have sufficient knowledge of open source software that I checked that box on the work process for them. And I I'm confident that they have the level of competency they need to proceed. It's your in order to, It's in order to meet the fifteen to thirty dollar per hour wage schedule. Yeah, like we or, basically or, think. Yeah, I think we filter that how much time we spend on it is first we achieve the revenue milestones, right? And that's 100%. by building the houses. Yeah, absolutely. Like, like let's imagine for a second that. Everyone shows up, they get the minimum safety stuff they need, and you literally send them straight to putting together the wall assemblies, right? Mm -hmm. Practical, hands-on stuff right up front. And then later you go back 
and mm -hmm. you know iterate through design collab all that stuff and it's piecemeal mm -hmm. right because in a given day they may bounce yeah. between all these different topics but it's at the end of the day it's your program you own it um mm -hmm. the only constraint mm -hmm. is that with after the two-year mark they should be competent according to what you're describing these you know topics in the work process which i think is the easy part for you like most employers can't guarantee that their apprentices are actually going to be able to put up a, a properly framed wall you have the opposite problem which is if you get the right person in there for two years and you can pay them the learning is going to happen it's going to happen by accident what about for example like go down scroll down hydraulics pneumatics like okay so that's tractor say we're building the tractors but one person's got like no interest in the tractors or the equipment part they just really like the carpentry part and they they're like nah forget everything else like how does that work um maybe that's not a right candidate because they're not open to learning yeah i mean i i'd say that it depends how it manifests if it manifests as i refuse to go out and play with the tractor then that's probably a right candidate problem. If it manifests mm -hmm. as I have a preference, like if I have a choice, I'd rather be doing carpentry, that's fine. I, you know, you've checked the box in terms of the work process by saying like, you know, you need to have an orientation to these hydraulic systems because they play an important role in what we do. And frankly, you're, we're paying you. So like, like it's, it's a part of your job to learn the basics of this system even if you don't have an interest in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, for the application, there's we can require, for example, a side visit. Mm -hmm. We can reset the rules for all this. This is just. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. We own it. Yep. Yep. Are you aware of any other strings that the government attaches to this kind of program? That we, we talked about 10 hours per month for record keeping. Uh, yeah. Anything that, else? Yeah. Yeah, that's my estimate. <clears throat> um, there's going to be an affirmative action and a bunch of boilerplate legal documents related to equal opportunity and diversity and inclusion that you're going to sign. Um, the, the Department of Labor in Missouri is clearly just following policy here, and it's all intent-based, not outcome. So if, you're, if the class of apprentices you bring on aren't, isn't very diverse, um, you know, socioeconomically or otherwise, then after two years, uh, they're going to do, they're going to have a, like, have you form a plan such that your recruiting mm. pool matches your actual population of apprentices. And so that, that's their approach to affirmative action, which is to say, if you're recruiting from anybody in the world, we would want your apprentice class to roughly reflect that level of diversity. Um, but it's, you know, as, the Deborah was explaining this to me. She was doing her best to like allay any fears of government overreach. And like, she was clearly like, look, we're, we mm -hmm. work with you. It's, it's all for a good intent. Mm -hmm. We want to help underrepresented and marginalized communities participate in all parts of the labor force. So. Is there a requirement for like how much, how much, how many months of that time they have to be on site? Uh, you mean of the, that? of the two years? So this, yep. Is it no. assumed that it's 100% on site or they can be like leaves, vacations, or time off, like independence, or like they're doing stuff? Um, oh, you know, they're yeah. Possibly do, studying theory at, at home or something. Because some yeah, people 100%. might ask, like. The, the distinction is going to be if they're not on site, but they're still on the clock. So, like, you, you're still going to have to pay them if they're doing things related to on the job learning um mm -hmm. but like your program is going to be unique in that that's even possible and so i honestly i wouldn't even bring it up like me like going home to see your family vacation all that kind of stuff should be a part of the you know schedule that you have and i'm sure it already is that shouldn't impact this as long as the expectation is the you know the when they're on site they're going to be doing this work process yeah okay I think let's do it. Okay. Roll. Uh, I will. I will translate everything that we talked about. I'll send it to you for approval. Um, 
and then send it to Deborah and Tracy. <laughs> yeah. I think that's it. Okay. Oh, uh, nice, nice guy. Actually, uh, you know, the guy who contacted me last time, man, that's, that's kind of encouraging. If we get people like that, like the guy who contacted with you, yeah. yeah, I got an email from him. That's, that's cool stuff. I mean, the, the, the underlying message there was, oh, and I was going to ask, uh, so, yeah, so he got diversity training through the military, actually, because he met a lot of different people. And then he, he really wants to help the world and stuff like that. If that's the kind of nature of person, that would be really cool. Uh, but m my question to you is, how does the, being on, say, in the Navy on a ship get you exposed to a lot of diverse people? Is it because the, the people from, are from all over the U.S., like all, all races, genders and stuff? Or Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what, what's the diversity like in the military? Is that what you're asking me? Just writ large? Yeah. yeah. Like, how does a person get, get diverse? diversity training in the military? Um, so I, the, the army, uh, I think, reflect, is, is slightly more diverse than um, general population. Or, or I, mm -hmm. I guess what I should say is like uh, underrepresented groups are slightly more represented in the military. Uh, I, I can't specify. But like, mm -hmm. let, forget that. Let's assume that it perfectly mirrors society. The, the diversity mm -hmm. experience of the military is that you're forced to interact and collaborate with people. You have nothing in common. So like everything. Right. Of, and that's good, every, right? That's, yeah, that's everything, pretty good. Yeah, exactly. Everything about your previous life is irrelevant. Once you start, ah. once you put on that uniform and then everybody's the same color, they say everybody's the color green mm -hmm. in the military. And now you're, you're, mm -hmm. you're, by like almost coercion you are forced to collaborate with people who are have completely different backgrounds and from all, mm. from all parts of the country so that's really where what the value of the military diversity experience is so that's pretty good so that'll take a person from missouri who's never traveled out of state to open up their mind right oh yeah 100 percent, and, and Again, that's a selection process issue, and and like, just keep in mind that like, in my experience in the military, I pulled the same guard duty, and slept in the same foxhole as, you know, the soldiers I led, who were often from completely different socioeconomic class, and so you have this like bleeding of ideas, this osmosis that happens just from sharing hardship with people you otherwise wouldn't interact. Okay, with. no, that's. Okay, that's cool. That's cool. That means we'll we'll get that element. So hence, like people's tartans for for freakiness, or doing things a different way, perhaps. Um, well, tell me about this doing doing things a different way, like innovation and all of that. Um, is there a good openness to that, or people are institutionalized in an aspect of creativity? Um. I think, well, I mean, it's, it's both. And it just goes back to what we talked about yesterday about the fat tails. So the, the veteran you get who at the high end of openness and uh, sense of adventure and desire for impact, they may, have, they may also exist in the civilian world. The difference is that they got all of the good stuff in the, the military provides on top. And the good stuff being what leadership, diversity leadership leadership understanding true accountability grit uh grit yeah grit is you know that grit would be important yeah yeah okay cool no i think i think so that basically it's like civilian plus some plus civilian plus yeah which is i think a good deal mm -hmm. yeah and if you're only if yeah. you're if you have 12 slots for your first class and mm -hmm. You, you know, the theory is out of the 250,000 veterans who separate each year, you can find 12 who meet your criteria. What would be the target app applicant pool? 100? Like, how, what would you say we would shoot for to get 100 applications or 24, 36? 2,000. 2,000? Yeah. Well, if that's the case, then we can, I think we can do damn well. I, mean, I, I don't see a reason why you wouldn't have, you know, it, there's going to be filters, right? So like the first gate, maybe yeah. fill out, you know, submit your email on this newsletter, right? That may be one gate. I don't, I don't see a reason why you wouldn't have in the thousands of 
people interested hmm. but that but that's a function of, of awareness right and like that's a marketing problem yeah. that you know yeah. we may need some help with yeah 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 and you think you think we'll um like the way things are with the resource i mean you're you're the main man on that in terms of the the market outreach to to the community but you think with your just between you and you and me that kind of a thousand scale number would materialize there? I mean, I think it's gonna take some time and I think it'll depend on your ability to guarantee uh, funding or our ability to guarantee that mm -hmm. the money's gonna be there for it. Um, but it's never been done mm -hmm. before. The, on, the only other model that this comes close to is college where you say there's a defined path where we lay out everything for you. You just have to express an interest that doesn't exist anywhere else outside the university system. What about other apprenticeships? I'm just apprenticeships in general. Uh, how, how, tell me, tell me, how do you mean like how this doesn't? Because I mean, apprenticeships do that, right? You, you, here's a path, but here we're saying the path is much broader in terms of we're saying we're going to save the world. On top exactly. of that, exactly. Mm -hmm. And no one, I, I, I don't think people can brand themselves that authentically as we do on that front. So that's that's the unique part because we're we're pretty serious about that. A lot of companies might be like, oh yeah, we'll do this, but it's like greenwash or whatever, just formalities. Um, so I think we're authentically unique in that. Yeah, and, and veterans especially, but people in general can see through that greenwashing very easily. Uh huh. Like. Like you're, if I was, if I was a PR specialist, my instinct would be like, like you're a Ted fellow who served on the president's, you know, was a, a science person recognized by the white house. That alone gives you, you know, the brand value to get people's attention, add on to that, all of the other steps that we're taking for credibility. And oh, make, yeah. you know, it's a competitive process. Like, like that combination of, of traits of aspects has has never been done before. I love it. Okay, I think we're gonna kill it. So my yeah. promise is to make sure that we get our stuff rigorous. Like we have enterprise session here where we're like getting very rigorous on all the steps and ergonomics of the build and the, yeah. the detail of procedure. So that, yeah, we can guarantee. I mean, it's looking by the day, like the other day, we put up the first floor in one hour and 15 minutes um, <laughs> from modules that we built, like that kind of stuff. That's data and that's positive data. That's 3.5 minutes per four by eight module installed per like with two teams. On. Uh, so uh, point is we're, we're getting some really good numbers and like the, the more data comes in, we're, we're getting more positive about the predictions. So it's good, it's looking good. Yeah, so yeah. my job is to make sure that that continues and is nailed um, rigorously. And then we will be able to accept any number of people, you know, because the cash flow will be there. Yeah, and that guy that reached out to you, I'm pretty sure his name's Rick, uh, the same guy that reached out to me. Like, mm -hmm. he's he's in college now. So, mm -hmm. so you're not just advertising to the people who are in the military about to get out. You're advertising to literally anybody who has GI Bill they haven't used yet. I was actually unclear from him whether he was saying that he's actually paying us for the apprenticeship or we're paying him. That was, that was an interesting one because he saw the advertising in our website where you're paying us to actually exactly. take the apprenticeship. Yeah, and, and, and that, that's another thing. Once this is approved, we're going to have to change terminology because right now you're calling it an apprenticeship, but it's really like a school. It's a six-month course because they're paying tuition. Mm -hmm. But that's a problem so later. Are you saying that typically when people use the word apprenticeship, that typically means implies uh, getting paid, not paying, right? Exactly. Yep. Okay. Excellent. Well, this is beautiful. So yeah, let's let's keep going. Gonna get back down there. But yeah, no. Okay. Once again, and thanks for all the work, man. This is great. This yep, is awesome. we're making progress. I'll uh, I'll get something in your box tonight. Okay. Thanks, John. Later. Send me the yep. Send me the recording, please. Thank all you. Right, take care. Bye. Bye-bye.